Yeah. Well, my name is Mr. Yukin. And ever since folks have been ground and finished, the name of Yukin's been in this particular trade, back almost 200 years or more. I do believe at this moment of time that me and my workmate, Bill Holmes, are the last two men working on their own account in this country. First of all, we have to grind these prongs and grind them level, keeping them symmetrical, removing every forging mark from the side. The idea is to keep the ball dead level at the same time keeping it symmetrical. If it's not kept symmetrical and it's well too long in one particular place, it causes an olive that is actually worse than the forge mark. So therefore the skill in the job is keeping it perfectly level. Also keeping the points level. The prong grinding. After grinding the prongs, we have to remove all forging marks from the shank. And there again, keeping it exactly in a symmetrical shape. As you can see, this one side is stamped much higher than that one. So therefore, the stone has to be brought into play and bringing it dead level with each other. After the first lay, which causes it to come level, as you can see there, then we keep the shank perfectly round, ready for the next process of smoothing down. The art of, of uh, fork grinding and, and finishing comes very much like swimming. You learn slowly at first, like an artist. And after a period of time, four, five, six, seven years, you get more skillful and more speedier in your job until you get an high degree of efficiency whereby that sometimes you can go along and do your job almost without looking at your job because if your fingers and hands are so working in, in uh, unison with one another that, that the article you're turning round on the laser will remain perfectly level. By that I mean that one hand mustn't keep moving out of sequence with the other. Both fingers must go together in order to keep a, in order to keep a level surface on the uh, fork that you're doing. I mean, if you, if you were turning one of these round, you can imagine what had happened if my hand was starting to move. Instead of that being kept perfectly round that way, it would be wavering. It's got to be kept in a perfect round smooth motion all the time. And this only comes with years of practice. In fact, I would say that it's, it's harder to learn than doing the instrument. Because it takes longer. I was first introduced to it as a boy in 1924 at the age of 11 years old. At that time when economic depression just after World War I, people were pretty poor. There wasn't much work knocking about, so we were more or less press gang to follow our fathers in this particular trade. Well, for the first two or three years of my working life, I used to go to work after school at four o'clock and work until half past six, half past seven, sometimes half past nine at night, until leaving school in 1927 at the age of 14. At that time, I'd had so much experience that I was almost as experienced as a young man that had spent five or six years in the trade from the age of 14 to 19 or 20.
After grinding, of course, they're very, very rough. They've got uh, scratch marks in, which, which uh, reduce with the grindstone. So we break down onto another tool called a rough laser, which is two or three grades smoother than a grindstone. A grindstone might be 60 grade, so we break down then onto a, an 80 grade. And this process is rough glazing, which we go over again the same way, prongs, and then glaze the shanks, and then glaze the aloes. That is a jolly grinder that I know well, and he works down in union mean. He's a mug when he's paid, but he's clever at his trade. His blades are best you see. He can work, he can play, he can grind, tear away, as much as any other fella can. He can lend and he can spend, he can grieve for a friend, and still there's the grinders, not a man. Well at that time, folks, there were no power to make folks like they do today. By that I mean machine-made folks. Folks them days were made by hand, mostly out in the country at Shire Green and Ecclesfield, by old-fashioned hand forges. Very often when I finished a day's work at twenty past six at night, I used to travel to uh, Shire Green and pick the folks up from the old hand forges, take them home at night, ready for me and father and grandfather to start work on, on them the following day. At that time, a fork grinder's expectancy of life was up to the age of about 28. By that time, if he was lucky, he might dodge the dreaded dust disease. Well, as time went on, after the <coughs> early 1930s, two, three and four, when the depression had really set in. Times were really bad. And at that time, if you had a bit of work to do, you used to lock your door in order to keep other fork grinders out of the shop. Because if they saw them, they knew you'd made them, and they would go to the place of where they were made and undercut price. At that time, we used to grind and finish a grosser forks, carving forks, for us princely sum of 25 shillings and fourpence per gross. If we were lucky, two men would finish these in about eight hours or a day's work. At that time, a week's wage would consist of about 50 bob to three pound after paying expenses for materials, grindstones, emeries, glue, etc. The next process to this is a finer still process. Instead of an 80 grade, we break down to an 120 grade emery, which is far, far smaller. We grease them on this with laying grease and compo on the glazer, breaking it down to a very small surface. We go over the same process again, grease glazing the prongs, follow on with grease glazing shanks, and bringing them up really smooth and wide. The next process is the flowering process. Now this grade of emery is so smooth, it's called flower emery, then, then hence the name flowering. We flower the shanks and then flower the prongs, bringing them almost down to a, a very matte, smooth finish. After this, we go on to what we call a felt. Now this is a mixture of wool, cotton and china clay. On this particular tool, there is no emery whatsoever. 
The only thing that's laid on is a compo, a polishing compo, which is, consists of beeswax, grease, china clay, and various other polishing compounds. We lay this on, and then follow the same process again by doing the shanks and the prongs. This brings them to a dull bright. It only means one slight slip on one of these revolving tools at 3,000 revs a minute. And things like this happens. The fork will slip in your hands. Drive back with such force that the tang will penetrate and go right through the back of the hand. I've had four or five of these during the last 20 years. Also been struck on the nose with shattered filing stones such as this. So it has quite a few dangers, although it doesn't look to the ordinary layman that there are. You have to be highly skillful and make sure that your, your mind is on the job and your hands do exactly what your mind says they've got to do. Otherwise you're in trouble. After that, we go on to a sisal dolly, which is a tool made up of sisal string closely stitched together. On this, we lay another polishing compound and repeat the previous processes down the prongs, along the shanks and the aloes. And then the last process is a calico dolly. On this, we lay a finishing compound and lay it lightly on and this brings it up to a final mirror-like finish. After which, it's delivered back to the warehouse, to the place from whence it first came. It's inspected, wiped over with clean dusters, and set aside ready for the big firms, the cutlers, such as Viners, Mapping and Webs, Richards, etc., to put the handles on, put it in its case, and it is then a final finished article. Sometimes people ask why we still s stick to our trade. Well after so many years you're more or less tied to it as you can see I'm coming to end of my time. But the beauty of the job is that we take pride in our work, we like our independence, we don't like gaffers breathing down our neck, we're on our own and therefore we can work as we please. Although we have to work sometimes 48, 50, 55 hours a week in order to, to keep a good, decent living standard. The trade is, is lost there. No youngsters will come into the trade now because their hands get so sore and tender after a few hours that no young man will stick to the job today. It's impossible to bring any new trainees into it. I think the youngest in the trade now is around 30 years of age and after they go, well, I don't think there'll be anybody else follow on with fork grinding. I do believe that within the next 25, 30 years, it will be absolutely extinct altogether.